Jeremy Neville Bamber is a convicted British mass murderer. He was convicted of the 1985 White House farm murders in Tolshunt, Darcy, Essex, in which the victims included Bamber's adoptive parents, Neville and John Bamber, his adopted sister, Sheila Cavill, and his six-year-old twin nephews. Ralph Neville Bamber, 61, was a farmer and former RAF pilot and magistrate at the Witham Magistrates Court. He married his wife, June Speakman, 61, in 1949 and moved into the Georgian White House farm in Tolshunt, Darcy, Essex. They owned 300 acres of farmland that belonged to June's father. Neville was described as a well-built, strong man who was six feet four and in great health. This became important during the trial as Jeremy's defense lawyers claimed that Sheila, who was a very petite woman, had been able to overpower, beat, and subdue Neville, which the prosecution contested. The couple were unable to have biological children and decided to adopt Jeremy and Sheila when they were babies, completely unrelated to each other. June suffered a lot with mental health issues and was very depressed. She was admitted into a psychiatric hospital in the 1950s, including the year after she adopted Sheila in 1958. June was given electroshock therapy at least six times. She was treated by a psychiatrist named Hugh Ferguson in 1982, who would also later treat Sheila. The Bambers gave their children a good life and were very financially secure. They had a good home and received a private education. However, June's relationship with the children weren't great, and her relationship with Sheila was particularly poor. June was extremely religious and would try and force her beliefs onto her children, along with her grandchildren. Sheila felt like her mother didn't approve of her and that she was a constant disappointment. Her relationship with Jeremy wasn't much better, as he eventually cut contact with her completely. Sheila was born on July 18, 1957, and was only 28 when she was killed. She was adopted by the Bambers in October of 1957 when she was only around three months old. She attended Secretarial College in Swiss Cottage, London. When she turned 17 in 1974, she found out she was pregnant, the baby's father being Colin Caffel. Her parents refused to let her have the child and forced her into giving an abortion. Sheila's relationship with her mother became worse when June found her and Colin sunbathing naked in a field and began calling her the devil's child. After her abortion, she continued studying and was eventually trained as a hairdresser and temporarily worked with the Lucy Clayton Agency as a model. In 1977 she became pregnant for the second time, and the couple decided to get married. Unfortunately, she miscarried during the sixth month of her pregnancy. Her parents wanted to out them during their hard times and bought the couple a garden apartment in Hempstead. She became pregnant a third time and once again, had a miscarriage. Sheila didn't give up and got pregnant for a fourth time, and gave birth to twin boys, Nicholas and Daniel, after being on bed rest in the hospital for four months. However, Sheila found out that Colin had started an affair before their sons were born, and left Sheila for the other woman just five months after they were born. They divorced in May of 1982. Sheila became extremely upset after the divorce, and her mental health declined more and more as time went on. The boys were placed into foster care between 1982 to 1983 due to her mental health problems. That being said, both parents were involved in their lives, and the boys were living with Colin for several months before the murders occurred. Colin had plans to bring the boys on vacation to Norway and scheduled a week-long visit to the Bambers farm home so they could spend time with them and Sheila before their trip. Colin dropped them off on August 4, and it was the last time he saw them alive. After the divorce, Neville purchased another apartment for Sheila, in Morshed Mansions, made of ale. She then decided to track down her birth mother who lived in Canada. The two met up briefly, but no relationship was started. Shortly afterwards she met a group of young women who nicknamed her Bambi. The women would later report that Sheila was very insecure and would often complain about her terrible relationship with her mother, and would also live on either welfare checks or low-paying jobs. Sheila and these women would often partake in partying, drugs, and fooling around with much older men. As her mental health continued to decline, she began episodes of banging her head against walls. Her psychiatrist, Ferguson, claimed that she was agitated and was psychotic and paranoid. She was admitted into St. Andrew's Hospital, a private psychiatric facility, where he later diagnosed her with schizophrenia. She was discharged in September of 1983 and began taking an antipsychotic medication. 
Ferguson claimed that she would talk about suicide, but did not deem her as a suicide risk. She also told Ferguson that she believed the devil had given her the power to bring evil onto others, and that she could even make her sons have sex and cause violence with her. She called the twins the devil's children, which was the same thing her mother, June, would call her. She also claimed that she was capable of murdering them or having them murder others. Five months before the murders, she was readmitted to St. Andrew's Hospital, after a psychotic episode where she claimed that others, including her boyfriend, were trying to hurt and kill her. It was at this point that the twins went to live with Colin. For weeks later she was discharged and would receive monthly injections of another antipsychotic medication. Sheila's mental health problems are exactly why the theory regarding Sheila causing a murder-suicide was so believable in the beginning. However, Ferguson told the court that the kind of violence that was necessary for this type of crime was not consistent in her behavior or the way he viewed her. He claimed that her deep relationship issues were with her mother, not her father or her children. Her ex-husband Colin supported Ferguson's statement and said that even though Sheila would throw fits of anger and sometimes hit him, not once did she ever lay a finger on their children. Sheila's aunt and niece also told the court that she was not a violent person and she had never used a gun and was never taught how to use a gun. However, on the night of the murders when Jeremy was standing outside the house with the police, he told them that he and Sheila had gone target shooting together in the past and later told the court that he had never seen her use a gun as an adult. Jeremy Neville Bamber was born on January 13, 1961. He was put up for adoption when he was only six weeks old and was later adopted by the Bambers when he was six months old. He attended St. Nicholas Primary School, then Malden Court Prep School, which Sheila also attended. In 1970 at the age of nine, he joined the cadet force while attending Gresham's boarding school. Jeremy claimed he was very unhappy there due to bullying and other issues. He left Gresham with no qualifications and attended Sixth Form College. His father, Neville, paid for him to go to Australia where he took scuba diving courses before going to New Zealand. Jeremy's former friends claimed that he had broken into a jewelry shop and stole a very expensive watch and also bragged about smuggling in heroin. Jeremy returned home to England in 1982 to work on his parents' farm. Neville set him up with a cottage which was just around a five-minute drive from their farm and 15 minutes or less by bike. Neville also gave him a car to use and 8% of a family business, Osea Road Campsites LTD. Three days before the murders on Sunday the 4th, 1985, Sheila and her sons arrived at the farm to spend time with June and Neville. The housekeeper claims to have seen Sheila that day and said nothing was unusual about her behavior. Additionally, two farm workers also saw her and the children and said everyone seemed happy and normal. On the evening of Tuesday the 6th, Jeremy visited the farmhouse. In court, he claimed that he had suggested that the boys be put into daytime foster care, and Sheila didn't seem bothered by the suggestion at all. Ferguson challenged this statement by saying any suggestions of putting her sons into foster care would have provoked Sheila, but she would have been open to having daytime help at her home. A farm worker heard Jeremy leave at 9.30. The farm's secretary, Barbara Wilson, called Neville around the time and claimed that he was short with her and seemed to hang up quickly in irritation, leaving her with the assumption that she had just interrupted an argument and claimed that he had never acted that way before. June's sister, Pamela, called them around 10 p.m. and said that she spoke to Sheila, who was quiet, and then to June, who seemed to be perfectly normal. In the early hours of August 7, Jeremy called the Chelmsford Police Station. It's important to note that he did not call the 999 emergency number. He notified the police that he had gotten a call from his father, asking Jeremy to come to the house quickly, as Sheila had gone berserk with a gun. He claimed that the line went dead in the middle of the call. After he called the police, he drove slowly to the farmhouse. There's a lot of contradictions in his story about these phone calls. In his early witness statements, Jeremy claims that he called the police immediately after he received the call from his father, and then called his girlfriend, Julie Mugford. After he called the police, the operator checked the White House Farm's landline number at 3.56 a.m., according to the police log, and at 4.30 a.m., according to the Court of Appeal. The operator found that the line was open, and could even hear a dog barking. At the time they didn't keep records of local calls, but experts during the trial claimed that if Neville did call Jeremy, and if he did leave the receiver off the hook, the call would have only been open for two minutes, which means Jeremy would not have been able to use his phone. 
Additionally, he claimed in later interviews with the police that it's possible that he called Mugford first and then the police and was confused about the sequence of events. When asked about why he didn't call the 999 emergency number, he claimed that he didn't think it mattered how long it took for the police to arrive. Jeremy claims his father sounded terrified on the phone, and even though he asked him to come to the house quickly, Jeremy instead decided to not call the emergency number, spent extra time looking up the number to the local police station, called up his girlfriend, and then proceeded to drive slowly to the house, and then waited outside the house until police arrived. He also acknowledged that he could have called one of the farm workers as well, but didn't consider it at the time. Later during the trial, the prosecution would argue that there was never a call between Neville and Jeremy. Instead, it was Jeremy who picked up the phone in the farmhouse, called his landline, and then left the receiver off the hook to establish an alibi and to further set the scene to paint Sheila as the culprit. Further evidence to support this claim is that Neville, according to the Court of Appeal, was very bloody around this time, and the phone had no visible blood on it when police examined the scene. However, it was also acknowledged that no swabs had been taken either. Three officers from the Witham police station passed by Jeremy on Page's Lane and arrived at the farmhouse around two minutes before he did, and later testified in court that Jeremy was driving very slow. Even his cousin, and Eaton, claimed that it was strange considering he was normally a fast driver. Everyone waited outside the house until 5 a.m. for a tactical firearms unit to arrive. They then decided to wait until daylight to try and enter the home, and spend an additional two hours trying to communicate with Sheila, but all they could hear was a dog barking. All the entryways to the home were closed, besides the window in the master bedroom on the first floor. While waiting outside the police began to question Jeremy, and said he was pretty calm considering his family was in danger and was likely hurt or worse. They asked him whether he thought his sister had gone berserk with a gun, and he replied, I don't know. She is a nutter. She's been having treatment. He also let them know that he didn't get along with his sister very much. Police then asked him why his father would call him for help instead of the police, to which Jeremy replied, My father was the kind of person who would want to keep things within the family. The next few hours consisted of him talking with an officer about cars and mentioning that he'd be getting a brand new Porsche soon. Jeremy also told police that when he was at the farmhouse a few hours earlier, he had loaded the rifle because he thought he heard rabbits outside, but ended up leaving the rifle on the kitchen table, fully loaded, with a box of ammunition right beside. The doctor who was called to the crime scene later testified that the family could have died at any point in the night, and claimed that Jeremy was in a state of shock, crying, and seemed to throw up. The police entered the home at 7.54 a.m., forcing their way inside by breaking the back door down with a sledgehammer. Five bodies were found with multiple gunshot wounds. Neville was found downstairs in the kitchen, and everyone else was upstairs. A total of 25 bullets were shot, most of them at a close distance. The phone that Neville called Jeremy with was lying on one of the kitchen surfaces with its receiver off the hook, with empty .22 cartridge cases next to it. Chairs and stools were overturned, along with a broken sugar basin, a broken ceiling light, and a broken crockery, and it looked like there was blood on the floor. Neville was dressed in pajamas and lying over an overturned chair near the fireplace. He was shot eight times, six times to his head and face while a rifle was only a few inches away from his skin. The remaining two shots to his body were from at least two feet away. Three empty cartridges were found in the kitchen and one upstairs, so the police concluded that Neville was originally shot upstairs but was able to make it downstairs where the struggle took place. He was then hit with the rifle multiple times, and then fatally shot. He had two wounds to the right side of his body and two to his head that would have caused unconsciousness. His lip was wounded, his jaw fractured, and his teeth, neck, and larynx were damaged. There were gunshot wounds to his left shoulder and left elbow. He also had linear bruising to his cheeks, a broken nose, and black eyes, along with linear bruising to his right forearm, lacerations to his head, bruising to the left wrist and forearm, and three circular burn-type marks to the back. It was also stated that the linear marks were consistent with him being struck with a blunt object, possibly with a rifle. It was brought up in court by the prosecution that Sheila wouldn't have been strong enough to give such a harsh beating to such a big and healthy man. June's body and clothing were heavily covered in blood and was found in her nightgown, barefoot. Based on the blood platter on her clothes, police assumed that she was sitting up during part of her attack. 
Her body was found lying on the floor near the door of the master bedroom. She was shot seven times. One of the shots to her forehead, right between her eyes, was shot just under one foot away from her. That shot, along with one other to her head, would have caused a quick death. There were also shots to her right forearm and right side of her lower neck and two injuries on her right knee and right side of her chest. Daniel and Nicholas were found in their beds, appearing to have been shot while in bed. Daniel was shot five times in the back of his head, once being over two feet away, and three times within one foot away. Nicholas was shot three times, all of them being in very close proximity. Sheila was found on the floor of the master bedroom, also in her nightgown and barefoot. She had two bullet wounds under her chin, one of them being on her throat. He also said the ire of the shots would have immediately killed her, while the other one would have been a slow death. He believed that the lower shot happened first due to the amount of blood down her neck, and later testified in court that the injuries she sustained would have made it possible for her to walk around, but considering the lack of blood on her clothes suggested that it was very unlikely that she had done that. He also said he believed that she was also sitting up when she was attacked, considering the pattern of the blood stains on her clothing. Blood and urine samples were taken from Sheila who had found haloperidol in her system, along with cannabis that she had taken a few days prior. There were also no marks on her body that suggested that she was in a struggle. Her feet and hands were clean, her fingernails were manicured and not broken, and she had no blood, powder, or dirt on her fingertips. There were zero traces of any lead dust. The magazine to the rifle would have been loaded two or three times during the murders, which would normally leave lubricant and materials from the bullets on the hands. Additionally, there was no trace of blood or other debris on her feet, such as the sugar that was scattered on the floor downstairs. There were also very low traces of lead on her hands, which a forensic scientist testified was consistent with the use of everyday use of things around the home, and if she had added 18 cartridges of bullets into the magazine, there would have been a lot more lead on her hands. The blood found on her nightgown was also her blood, and no one else's. Sheila's right ring finger was found on the right side of the butt of the rifle, pointing down. Jeremy's right forefinger was on the rear end of the barrel, above the stock, and pointing towards the gun. There were an additional three fingerprints that could not be identified. A farming family affectionately dubbed the archers was slaughtered in a bloodbath yesterday. Brandishing a gun taken from her father's collection, deranged divorcee Sheila Bamber, 28, first shot her twin six-year-old sons. She guns down her father as he tried to phone for help. Then she murdered her mother before turning the automatic .22 rifle on herself. This was an article reported in the Daily Express on August 8, 1985, just a day after the murders. This article was the result of a very poorly done investigation. Not only was the murder scene not properly secured, but the evidence wasn't recorded or preserved, the crime scene officer moved the murder weapon without wearing gloves, and it took several weeks before the gun was examined for fingerprints. The police also burned blood-stained bedding and carpets, supposedly to protect Jeremy's feelings. Within only three days of the murder, Jeremy and the extended family were given the keys back to the home. The police also did not find the silencer at the scene of the crime, one of Jeremy's cousins found it on August 10 and took it back to another cousin's home, where they noticed bits of what looked like red paint and blood on it. It took the police three more days to retrieve it. Later, the cousins noticed scratch marks on a mantle that had red paint, which investigators assumed came from the struggle with the rifle. The police also didn't take proper notes, and the officers who dealt with Jeremy that night didn't write down the statements until weeks later. All the bodies were released just a few days after the murders, and all but the children's bodies were cremated. Additionally, Jeremy's clothes weren't examined until a month afterward, and all blood samples were destroyed ten years later. Jeremy's family became increasingly suspicious of him possibly being involved in the murders due to his strange behavior before and after the funeral. The family claimed that he was crying at the funeral and seemed to be genuinely upset, but when everyone started to leave the funeral service and he thought no one was looking at him, a family member saw him smiling. They claimed that he wiped away his crocodile tears and had a huge grin on his face. Also, during the wake after the funeral, he was cracking jokes and laughing. Not too long after the funeral, he and his girlfriend Julie Mugford traveled to Amsterdam with a friend and purchased a lot of cannabis. The travel agent testified that the group, especially Jeremy, seemed to be in very high spirits. He also began to sell off his family's belongings, 
including both of his parents' cars. He also tried to sell 20 new photos of Sheila and went on another vacation overseas to St. Tropez with a friend. Julie had originally told police the day after the murders that Jeremy had called her at home in the early hours of the 7th, between 3 and 3.30 a.m., to tell her something was wrong at the home and that he seemed worried. She told police that she was tired and didn't think of asking him any questions at that time. Her statement changed a month later, following a series of arguments between her and Jeremy. On September 7, Julie went to the police station, alleging that Jeremy had been planning to kill his family. For days before she changed her statement, she claimed she and Jeremy got into an argument about ending their relationship. Jeremy wanted to call it quits, and during the argument, she asked him if he had any involvement in the murders, which escalated the argument. In the middle of it, he received a call from another woman, and Julie found out he was cheating on her. She called him a psychopath, smashed a mirror, and slapped him, which in return caused him to twist her arm behind her back. In her second statement she claimed that between July and October of 1984, Jeremy had said that he wished he could get rid of them all. He spoke awfully about his mad mother and old father and said that Sheila had nothing to live for and her children were disturbed. He said his parents were trying to ruin his life and the fact that his father was paying for Sheila's nice apartment annoyed him. Julie claimed that he told her that he would sedate his parents, shoot them, and then burn the house down and said that Sheila would make a good scapegoat. He also told her that he would cycle along the back roads to get to the home, enter the house through the kitchen since the catch was broken, and he would leave through a different window that would lock from the outside. He would also make a phone call while inside the farmhouse to his home. She told police she never felt concerned about these conversations because she deemed them to be just idle talk and that Jeremy had claimed to have killed rats with his own hands before, so he could test whether or not he'd ever be able to kill, and concluded that he could never kill his own family, even though he had fantasies about it. Julie further explained that she had spent a weekend with Jeremy before the murders back at his cottage. She said he dyed his hair black and saw his mother's bicycle there. She further claimed that Jeremy had called her at 9.50 p.m. on August 6 and told her he was thinking about the crime all day, and was pissed off and told her it was tonight or never. At 3 a.m. he called her again saying, everything is going well. Something is wrong at the farm. I haven't had any sleep all night. Bye honey and I love you lots. He then called her once more later that morning to inform her that Sheila had gone mad, and the police were coming to take her away. When she arrived with the police at Jeremy's cottage, he pulled her to the side and said, I should have been an actor. These statements from Julie are what led to Jeremy's arrest. It's important to mention that Julie had admitted to a brief background of dishonesty. In 1985 she was cautioned for using her friend's checkbook when it was reported stolen and claimed that she and a friend had repaid all the money they used back to the bank. She also said she helped Jeremy back in March of 1985 to steal from the Osea caravan site that his family owned. She told them that he had staged a break-in to make it look like it was strangers who committed the crime. Jeremy was arrested and charged on September 8, 1985. He told the police that Julie was lying and being spiteful due to wanting to get back at him for breaking up with her. He said that he loved his family and denied the accusations about thinking his parents shorted him on money. He claimed that the only reason he broke into the caravan site was to prove that they had poor security. He told them that he saw his parents while stating that he and Sheila would both share the estate and that the silencer on the gun wasn't used often because it wouldn't fit into its case if it was on. The trial started on October 3, 1986, and lasted 18 days. He was very arrogant during this time and at one point when the prosecutors accused him of lying, he said, that is what you have got to establish. The prosecution argued that Jeremy was motivated by greed and hatred. He went to his parents' farmhouse for dinner on August 6 and left around 10 p.m. to go back to his cottage. In the early hours of the next morning, he went back to the farm on his mother's bicycle, went along the back roads to avoid detection on the main roads, and approached the farm home from the back. He entered the house through the bathroom window downstairs, grabbed the rifle with the silencer attached, and made his way upstairs. From there he proceeded to shoot his mother, June, while she was sitting up in her bed, and she was able to walk a few steps before collapsing on the ground and dying. He's not his father, Neville, as well, but he was able to make his way downstairs where he and Jeremy fought in the kitchen, where Jeremy was able to shoot him an additional four times, twice at the top of his head and twice in his temple. He shot his sister, Sheila, 
in the main bedroom next to her mother, made his way to the children's room where they were sleeping, and shot them in their beds. Jeremy then arranged the crime scene by trying to make it look like Sheila committed the murders before turning the gun onto herself. Jeremy knew that Sheila could not have reached the trigger or the silencer attached, so he removed it from the rifle and returned it to the cupboard where the guns were stored. He then placed a Bible next to her body to make it look like a religious theme. After he removed the kitchen phone from the hook, he possibly took a shower and then left the home through a kitchen window, and banged the window from the outside so the catch would fall back into place. Then he cycled back to his cottage and waited until 3 a.m. to call his girlfriend, Julie Mumford, then the police at 3.26 a.m., where he claimed to have just received a call from his father and explained that his sister had gone berserk with a gun. He created a delay before the bodies could be discovered by not calling the emergency 999 number, drove very slowly back to the farm, and told the police that Sheila was very familiar with guns to prevent them from going into the home sooner. They also argued that Jeremy had never received a phone call from his father and that he would have been too badly injured after the first shots he received to have been able to speak to anyone. No blood on the phone was left off the hook, and Neville would have called the police and not Jeremy in such an extreme situation. They also argued that if such a call was made to Jeremy, he would have not only called the emergency 999 number, but he also would have called and notified the farm workers to try and get help, and then drive quickly to the farmhouse. One of the biggest roles of the prosecution case regarded the silencer. It was concluded to have been on the rifle when it was fired due to the blood that was found inside of it. They said the blood was from Sheila's head when the silencer was pointed at her. Had she discovered that she could not shoot herself with the silencer attached, it would have simply been found next to her body. There would have been no reason for her to return it to the gun cupboard. It was also argued that Sheila had not recently expressed suicidal thoughts, and a medical professional claimed that she would have never harmed her children or her father. There was no evidence on her body or her clothing that she had moved around the house or was involved in any struggle. The only blood found on her was her own. The defense argued that the witnesses who claimed that Jeffrey hated his family were all lying or had misinterpreted what he was saying. They claimed that Julie lied because she was hurt by his betrayal. No one had seen him cycling to and from the farm, and there were no marks on his body that suggested that he was in some kind of struggle. Additionally, blood-stained clothing of his was never discovered. They argued that the reason he didn't drive as quickly as he could have to the barn was due to being afraid. They said that Sheila knew how to use guns since she was raised on a farm and went shooting when she was younger. She also had a very serious mental illness and had told her psychiatrist at one point that she felt like she was capable of killing her children. She saw the loaded rifle and extra cartridges on the kitchen table and became enraged at the recent argument about putting her children in daytime foster care, which caused her to snap. A former boyfriend testified that Sheila had a mental breakdown around him in 1985 when she started banging the walls because the phone died while she was in the middle of a call. He claimed she said the phone was bugged and talked about God and the devil and how the devil loved her. He further told the court that he had feared for the safety of others around her, who had an intense dislike for her mother, June. The defense continued to argue that people who have committed altruistic murders have been known to engage in ritualistic behavior before killing themselves, so she might have placed the silencer back into the cupboard, washed up, and changed her clothes, which would explain why there wasn't much lead on her hands or sugar on her feet and clothes. There was also a possibility that the blood inside the silencer was not hers, but the blood of Neville and June. The judge told the jury that there were three very important questions to think about. Who did they believe? Jeremy or Julie? Did Neville make that call to Jeremy? If he didn't, his whole story goes out the window, because the only other way he would have known about the shootings is if he had committed them himself. The last question was twofold, were they sure that Sheila wasn't the killer who then committed suicide? And, was the second, fatal, shot fired at Sheila with the silencer on? If that answer is yes, then she could not have fired it. The jury deliberated for more than nine hours, and on October 28, finally reached this decision, Jeremy Bamber was found guilty by a vote of 10 to 2, the minimum required for a conviction. He was sentenced to five life terms, with the recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. In December of 1994, Home Secretary Michael Hour told Jeremy that he would remain in prison for the rest of his life, which followed the decision by the Home Secretary of the Day, Douglas Hurd, in 1988. Jeremy is now 63 years old and still serving his whole life tariff in prison. 
he has applied many times to overturn his conviction and his whole life tariff, and all were denied. His extended family is still convinced of his guilt, however, he has many supporters who believe he's innocent and has campaigned for his release for years.